delighted to have you back to this our 267th episode of this our show think tech wise human humane architecture and thank you for being our 14,400 accumulated viewer and your host DeSoto Brown in his Bishop Museum and me Martin Despang in the Waikiki Grand we are happy to have our guest back Bainish Architects uh, Boston's branch uh, leader, Matt Noblet. Hi, Matt. Hi, good morning. This time we're all in the morning. <laughs> this time yes. we are all yes. because we're we're holding on to you and not letting you go back to Boston. <laughs> and uh, can we get the first slide up because then we can better explain where you are actually, which we were talking about some shows ago to Soto here with Ron. And this is on Caimana Beach or Sans Souci, or uh, there is also there's multiple names for the for the same thing, right? Yes. Uh, and you are in that hotel where we actually put you up as the school because we had you give uh, your talk. Thank you for that on Monday. And since we unfortunately stupidly didn't record it, we are making up for that in multiple episodes here. <laughs> so reflect a little bit on where we put you up, uh, except that we see you sweating out there in the sun for the sacrifice of demonstrating <laughs> tropical exotic easy breeziness, which you to Soto and I, I'm worse than you because you're honestly in your having to be conditioned museum while I pretend to be somewhere in the jungle and having <laughs> stolen one of your images. <laughs> Met and I'm sitting in my in my bathroom, which is uh, by the way doesn't have AC either. But I'm sweating for for hermetic reasons, and you're sweating for easy breezy out in the sun. Yeah. Every... So yeah. reflect yeah. a little and... bit about the the building you're in, <laughs> Matt. Yeah. So I mean, I don't exactly know when the building was built, but um, it is it, it is actually quite an interesting little hotel with a very lovely uh sort of lobby restaurant situation at the ground that goes right out to the to the beach and the monk seals come up in the morning and uh occasionally there's some human seal interaction which i think is not supposed to happen but um <laughs> with some with with sometimes less fortunate uh results and sometimes uh yeah but um no and it's it's really actually and it has a very a, a kind of a completely uh outdoor interior atrium that allows you if, if i could figure out a way to prop the door open without leaving it sort of unlocked and and unsecure all night i'd have perfect cross ventilation through my through my room with this big lanai door that's that's right here in front of me but yeah and with uh, ron lindgren who we see here and by the way uh the soto uh did you see his email he survived his four teeth extraction so we're I so did. happy ron and so yes we are and so uh, Ron was, uh, you know, with us uh, thinking about a recent remodel they had been doing. And bottom right is is a sign on the beach, some few feet away in my direction, uh, Matt, because we're actually pretty close to each other now here, geographically, by ironically through technology, kind of separated. And then there is a stand in the shape of a surfboard that talks about. Uh, the friendship of uh, Princess Kaiolani and uh, Mr. Um, Stevenson, who wrote Treasure Island. And I, it reminds me of the recent styles and in interior of hotels. It's kind of the Treasure Island style with like rattan, which they don't do too much these days anymore, and ropes. Or in this case, uh, the kind of mimicking the color of the ocean with a turquoise upholstery color, right? Which is, um, you know, not bad, but a little pomo, which where you and I uh, met are uh, allergic to, because that's when we had our education at the peak or at the demise of it, right? Because as you said, shouldn't one do the real deal and actually capitalize on the easy breeziness and natural ventilation that you have the best condition for being sort of a single loaded corridor wrapped around a courtyard, right? And talking about your topic, one of your topics of technology integration, we're always told it's a fire rating issue. You can't have the door open, then the tragic Marco Polo disaster happens. But come on, if there is a will, there is a way. I'm thinking of Dr. Haas, who is in Germany, the most prolific you know, fire rating engineer that saved my uh, solid timber, 40,000 square foot disabled school with only having you know, two um, smoke detectors and no sprinklers in there, thanks to the, you know, uh, property of solid timber, as you know it so well, uh, through one of your projects that we're going to have a glimpse of. So 
anyways, thanks for being, uh, you know, happy where we put you. Except you said the <laughs> jackhammer, so we said hopefully we got a good discount count on that on on your expense. As long as you and, can't hear them this morning, I think it's okay. Yeah, yeah. No, we we don't hear them. I want to just toss in one little uh, historical part of the site of the hotel. And Matt, as, if, as you've seen, and uh, Martin, as you know, there is this original uh, wooden balustrade along the beach side of the hotel where the dining room is, the Hau Tri Lanai, and that harkens back to a house which was formerly located on this same site. Uh, this hotel was built in, I think, 1964-65, as Waikiki was growing very abruptly due to the jet age, but it does have some elements of the 19th century, and they do talk about how it is a historic site of formerly a private home. Mm -hmm. Okay, so after this, Matt, I'm going to pick you up and drive you to the airport, and already in the airplane, you have to dress differently and you can probably then just keep that on in where you're going back to boston yeah and to yeah. give the audience an idea of how your workplace there looks and the other ones around the world so we can get the next slide up and which is actually a video so thanks for playing that eric <laughs> here we go it already started yeah so this is this is a sort of spliced together uh run through three of our offices at the time that we made it we were three offices, Boston, Stuttgart, and, and Munich, but um, we kind of really prize uh, sort of being agile in our workplace, being able to, you know, kind of reconfigure teams and groups um, and, and have all of the activity centered around, you know, project work and models and, and, and tad, tactile, tangible things that, uh, you know, samples of materials and so forth. So, these are all, uh, you know, people who we've worked with for many, many years. Um, this last year, now we've just stepped into Munich. It's like it's like being able to teleport, you know, basically. But um, Munich at night. But uh, yeah, and this is sort of like, you know, how we work is uh, this kind of very non-hierarchical um, kind of organization where everybody's there. Are no, there's no the partners and everybody who kind of operates the office sit in exactly the same kind of space that you see here together with uh, with all the architects. And it's really just, a, it's a uh, an attempt to kind of democratize the whole operation in a, in a very horizontal way. Absolutely. And going to the next slide, you are actually the uh, tropical extension of the whole enterprise because for personal <laughs> reasons, you have been on our islands for 30 years through your wife and her family and your daughters having grown up here in parts. That's right. So the, the office is really lucky to have you with that because otherwise all three locations are in temperate climate zones. So no surprise, and it gets us to the next slide, that you have been traditionally been operating in, in temperate climate zones. Uh, but you guys are moving on and along, and uh, we have been uh, selecting two projects exemplary as to have you go through more in detail. Mm -hmm. And that is uh, one of the very early ones and one of the very latest ones. But walk us through principally here through the timeline and also touch on the other ones that we're going to not have the time to go deep into. Yeah, no, I mean, this is a kind of a, an endeavor that started of almost 30 years ago, um, my my partner Stefan sort of was always interested in figuring out how to work outside of Germany and kind of export some of the, you know, I think relatively progressive thinking that, that's gone on there for, for maybe a lot of pragmatic reasons. It's not like, it's not as if Germans are just better people or more altruistic than all their humans. It's it's just that uh, the government that, is. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Historically, uh, we have know, seen the, that. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> It's just it's it's you know energy prices and limited uh, you know land opportunities and things sort of have an impact on um, on the way that development happens and so I think there's a there's just been a little bit more progressive thinking in terms of how you can operate in these climates. So we did back in 1991 the uh, so-called IBN uh, Institute for Forestry Research at uh, Wageningen University in the Netherlands, which was a at the time a kind of European pilot project for sustainability. And uh, 
was was kind of the first foray into both international experience and also a really highly sustainable building for a very progressive client there. Um, sort of fast forward to the uh, early 2000s at the Genzyme building in Cambridge. That was our first North American project uh, and was also one of the first lead platinum buildings uh, of its size in the US and, and became quite well known both for its kind of sustainable attributes, but also for the kind of way that Genzyme used that as its own brand in a sense, right? Uh, as they moved through uh, subsequent years of development, that really became uh, synonymous with their brand, this kind of approach to sustainable uh, building. Um, and, and I think generally a lot of these projects, they all kind of represent uh, kind of milestones in our the evolution of our thinking. Um, in the top, the very topmost photograph there is at the World Intellectual Property Headquarters in Geneva, which is a building for the United Nations. Uh, that was one of the largest all timber structures uh, in Europe at the time, mass timber construction. Um, the uh, Portland State University Carl Miller Center uh, was an all passively ventilated building that uh, we did in Portland, Oregon. Back, uh, it opened in 2018. And then the most recent building, the uh, Science and Engineering Complex at Harvard was, uh, a no, it, was a light, it was also a lead platinum building, but also one of the first living building challenge, uh, metal certified buildings uh, in the world. Okay, well, go to the next slide, which I will hold up as another confirmation of the points. This is the, the daily Think Tech Hawaii newsletter, sort of. And so this is another German guy, our current president, Bundeskanzler. And the subtitle is Germany is upsetting its allies in Europe. So that's, we continue to upset people. <laughs> And, and this is just a slide quickly personal on my side um, that as we I've been talking on my own uh, about the kind of the cross paths that we had uh, met uh, over the years. And top left is that we ended up uh, representing my hometown of Hanover um, in the fate and 21st century of yeah, architecture world atlas and it's like we're on the same side on the opposite ends. Why the North LB, your guys' project is high tech and high end, and ours is low tech and low end, but they both fight for the same thing, right? And I was, I think it's fantastic that that city of like, you know, half a million people and, and the, the fate and decided to choose projects representing it that are looking at things in a bioclimatic performative way and not just in a formal way. And so that, that was really nice. And so was Stefan when he basically stepped up and fought for us fiercely when uh, we uh, scandalously won what you had been winning before the Lower Saxony States Award of Architecture, which is the highest award on a state level with that iconic building. And the next year it went to the neighbor of that kindergarten, which is a community grocery stores where you can buy underwear in the six pack, which many didn't get. And for that reason, wanted to tell us that. And they pulled us out on a panel discussion that was called Fear Streiten. So usually I prepare you to Soto for your weekly German lesson. Can you figure by me not having prepared you what that means, Fear Streiten? No, so I can't. Fear is for and Streiten is argue. So four people arguing and two of the people arguing you see at the very bottom left, which is Stefan. And then next to her, him is uh, who we now know better than in the past, because back then she was the uh, state minister, secretary of family and cultural affairs. She has moved on over a couple of steps of being the minister of defense of Germany. She's now the commission president of the European Union, Ursula von der Leyen. And Stefan was kind enough to spend an afternoon with my clients and then having grabbed the microphone and having said that, and he said, I could have never worked for the guys because they were so cheap. And uh, the whole budget they were given for the whole project was what I had for the double facade, <laughs> poor guys. And again, very collegial, right? He could have done something much better, could have spent an afternoon. And by the way, um, you know, Hans Otto um, and uh, Thomas, I love you. These are my clients, you know. <laughs> uh, and so that just speaks for, and for me, it was an interesting point because um, we were kind of foreseeing the, the world, uh, which we're seeing right now, recession coming up. There was the one in 2008, and we were kind of foreseeing that. 
And although Stefan tried so hard, or maybe, you know, he was another reason why we then didn't get any commissions anymore, not that I'm blaming him. And I'm feeling in a good way, I'm feeling like Alfred Price, who after the Arizona Memorial and the zoo entrance, which they're kindly remodeling finally here in our front yard, Matt and I, uh, he got no commissions and he went on to become a policymaker. And probably without Stefan having fought for me, I wouldn't be in Hawaii, if you think yeah, about it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, everything no, I think, happens I mean, I think, for a reason. And I think it's interesting. I mean, you you know, you mentioned sort of like, you know, the the higher end, high budget, lower end, lower budget kind of projects that have something in common. I mean, this is a really important thing uh, that we have to emphasize when we talk about these things. You know, we show, you know, the projects we do do tend to be, I mean, we've always been a little bit, you might say kind of big game hunters over the years, but um, you know, these, these are the principles behind these projects apply at all scales and at all levels. And I think um, increasingly, you know, to, as architects, we have to be much, much more vocal about what we need to be accomplishing for even the simplest task, right? I don't yeah. think that big fancy uh, academic buildings for wealthy universities, you know, or what you know, big development buildings downtown are the only avenues where one has to sort of apply this kind of a, this kind of thinking. Um, certainly, this hotel is a fairly basic building that has all the right sort of strategies in place. It's not that difficult and uh, doesn't require a lot of money. And in fact, if it's done right, it should require less money, if not in yeah. the outset and in the initial costs in the running costs um, over time, right? In, in getting that right, I'm happy you remind me of that, that I have to correct it a little bit because the initial connection we, we have with you guys is that both Gunther's, uh, my father and Stefan's father are from, from Saxony. They're both from Dresden and my father just, recently was in the Zang Benno gymnasium at an open house and the uh, director was all over the place and was so happy with it. And that is a public, that's just like our kindergarten, right? That is a public German project on a, on a, on a cap budget, on a low budget. And you guys did just as well as with the more prestigious programs, right? And, and budgets there. So thank you for reminding us to say that. But I want to, you know, what what is here the point? I then soon after that uh, started to go to the U.S. also and uh, to coach here. And uh, your Gensheim building was really, um, you know, uh, uh, an encouragement for me because it was like, OK, I'm going out into the world, venturing out of my comfort zone. And by that time, you were doing that as well. So the, the building was, was once again, was, was a real sort of help for me as to say, I'm not by myself out there in, uh, in being sort of on a, on a diplomatic mission. And because I guess, I think we Germans, as you point out DeSoto correctly, uh, you know, we, we get a little bit too full of ourselves at times. And um, back then really, worst way right but even recently again where we thought you know meaning well to get off um, you know the fossil but then it didn't happen fast enough right and that's another thing i mean these projects met have been a while ago the north lb and that kindergarten were at the beginning of this millennium that we're now you know a fourth into that century and um you know we're still in in that trouble because if everyone would have built that way since then, we wouldn't be in trouble. So I guess this is probably just another wake up call for everyone to finally join us, right? Yeah, but you know, that's the way the world works. Things go along status quo until there's some catastrophic reason that you've got to change. And this is how, for example, building codes change after an earthquake or after a, a natural disaster or after a fire. That's when we make changes that require people to rethink how to do things so that you don't kill people literally in certain situations. And so this is the same, the same situation. And it's uh, something I remember very well from the energy crisis of 1973 and 74, when I was already 20 years old. And it was a sudden wake up call that scared everybody all over the world. Yeah, to suddenly make us bring us into the reality of where we were. Yeah, and then people didn't want to listen to our favorite uh, president, Jimmy Carter, right? That's right. And and talking maybe Matt, this is uh, you were telling us a story 
talking. And Stefan was actually in this case educating Ozala quite a bit by having stepped up because after him, she grabbed the microphone and said, well, Stefan, if you have your coming out and telling me about uh, the background stories, I want to do this as well because I had to initially give the award and I didn't know what I was giving to because I didn't find it beautiful. And then she, you know, she's the daughter of uh, our governor in Lower Saxony, so she knows how to, you know, but let's just give it, you know, that Stefan, you know, taught her about democracy and about, you know, the substance of things versus the surface and talking presidents in our island having a past president. Uh, let's share that little story that you told us, Matt, about Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. And uh, his recent uh, talk at the AIA conference in Chicago. Yeah, well, of course, I mean, I'm sure all of us on the island are, are well, not all of us, but certainly the majority of the people here are big fans of the, of the former president. And it was, a, it was a, an opportunity this summer for me to go hear him speak in Chicago at, uh, at the uh, AIA convention. So it was a room full of, I don't know, 10 or 15,000 architects and he was probably the only non-architect there, but uh, it, it, the first question they asked him was, you know, what was his favorite building in the world that he'd visited? And uh, and I I didn't know quite what to expect, but, um, you know, he started talking a little bit about the Sydney Opera House and, and, uh, and, and maybe a few other kind of notable things. But then he came back around and he said, but you know, the really the building that I love the most, there's an architect in Hawaii uh, from the mid the mid century, and when he said that, my heart stopped because I thought, is he really gonna say? Is he gonna give like the perfect answer to this question? Like, I mean, he's already up on a pedestal, right? And then, is he gonna actually say it? And he and he said he said, and this guy's name was Vladimir Osipov, and uh, there's a little house that he did up on the hill in Tantalus behind where I went to school, and uh, and it was it's called the Lillestrand House, and he said, I have to say, I think that's my favorite building. And I just thought this was, I mean, at that point, he, he's, he's achieved God status. Then at that point, right? <laughs> yeah, just like along with Jimmy Carter, who I think we shared in some shows ago, I learned on the big island by an Uber driver that Jimmy was building a Habitat for Humanity houses there on, on the mm. big island. So the two mm. of them are, are up there. And um, I was wondering, I was actually, shame on me, it took me 10 years to get to Punahou first time mm. they had an open house and obviously obama did and so maybe he knew that he <laughs> and i did too and you did too yeah and so maybe he knew the chapel to begin with right first I, I think oh yeah he did. oh sure definitely he did. but it's yeah, but it's yeah. interesting and, and we need to talk more to soto from your experience if it has always been the way it's operated right now because i honestly was disappointed because it was full-blown a seed and artificially lit so i'm curious um how that has been, but that's for another show, yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So I'll save that for, for later. But maybe we want to add, because you, uh, Matt, if you run into Barack Obama on the um, on the uh, east side of this island here, because Kailua yeah. isn't too far away from where he built his new house, which we right. can talk about it, however, right. in that case, controversially as well. Um, then you might ask him discreetly if uh, talking about the other architect that he talked about, Utsan, because we have some, so do you remember the background info we got from Magi Sakimaka about UH and Utsan? You remember that by any No, time? I don't, no. So uh, uh, we just talked about it, Matt. You wanna recap it the way we just talked about it? Yeah, I mean, I didn't know this story myself, but apparently, you know, as he was working through the uh, the early sort of design periods of uh, the Sydney Opera House, he kind of, I, I mean, I guess you said he kind of had a, a bit of a breakdown or, you know, just needed to kind of like take a break and recharge. And he came to Hawaii uh, to teach here at the university um, at, at the school. And with, you said he stayed in Kailua even, which is, you know, where, where my family's from, but yeah. Uh, quite i mean quite remarkable right and, <laughs> and 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 making doing the math about the timeline um it was not where we made you shiver on monday in the ice chest of the auditorium <laughs> of the pomo piece of k school of architecture building it is now but the predating it that we're very much in favor to so to the portables that our uh, university keeps saying, oh, we need to get rid of these because they're like outdated. No, no, these are actually the only good ones. You <laughs> should get rid of 
a lot of stuff you've been building ever since and you maybe you should tear down what you're currently building a lot of that stuff and and bring the portables back now i i send you and you should all go look back into it. it's it's in one of our uh shows the soto and we did so many now we forget i have the same problem that we threw this in because my former colleague maggie who's now teaching in australia she was digging out pictures of utson in these portables um just there at, at the school of architecture the, the way it was in easy sure. breezy yeah and one of the ironies is that the so-called portables which were supposedly temporary are now old enough to be considered as uh you know historic structures because they're they're 50 years old or older yeah 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 and they're everything we talk about they're single loaded corridor they're naturally shaded and never mind you know they <laughs> Some are a little sissy and they say, oh, it's a little hot in there. And then they add, you know, single unit wall AC, but principally they're still demonstrating. So um, we get the next slide up, which has to be the last because we're almost at the end of the show, but it's just showing what you probably have to throw on, as we already said soon, Matt, not quite as bad, right? <laughs> not because quite, not quite. Not winter. But this is going to be the, uh, the 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 appetizer sheet as uh, you sharing with us the Gensheim building in detail next time next week, and also mm -hmm. um, you have structured your talk into three categories, and the one up there at the top left is the first category that you sort of categorize the project under. So we're uh, looking much forward to that hearing about that and um yeah until then um guess uh we will the three of us will see each other very soon because once i will have you picked you up in about 20 minutes matt we're going to drive over to you to solo not getting stuck in that same traffic jam that you got stuck in <laughs> and then we're going to have a good time the three of us finally getting to know you guys getting to know each other also in person before we then reconvene remotely half across the continents next week <laughs> sounds so, good all right yeah looking forward to all of that and uh, see you all next week for that bye bye take care Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.